Good morning and welcome to the 80th Maine Agricultural Trade Show. I'm Gary Fish, state horticulturist, and our first presentation will be on the department's hemp licensing program. Our speaker today is Mary Yolina, the hemp program manager. If you have questions, please type them into the chat box and we will have a couple of spots during the presentation where we will answer those questions as we go along. If we cannot answer all the questions, please send them to Mary or Gary at their email addresses, maryyurlina at maine.gov or gary.fish at maine.gov. So uh, take it away, Mary. All right, thanks, Gary. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, good morning. This is my first time doing a virtual presentation. So we'll, oops, is, and already it doesn't seem to be working. Let's see, here we go. All right, I am talking about hemp and uh, for a little bit of botanical or taxonomic background, um, I'm talking about cannabis sativa and that is hemp and it is also marijuana. It's the same plant. Um, they come in very in varying uh, shapes and sizes, tall, skinny, sprawling, compact. They're grown for fiber, grain, resin. There's male plants, female plants. There's high THC plants. There's low THC plant. It's all the same, cannabis sativa. Here is the brief legal history of hemp. Um, there were flourishing farms in the United States back in the 30s and through the 50s. And in fact, the uh, United States government uh, promoted hemp, especially during the war. We needed fiber for rope and textiles. Um, however, hemp kind of got uh, a bad reputation uh, it, it, because of it's the same plant as marijuana. Um, and there was a war on drugs and by 1970, we had the Controlled Substance Act, and there was this legal union of hemp and marijuana. Um, and uh, I think there was there was very few farms. Uh, uh, by 1957, the last farm in Wisconsin closed down that was growing hemp. Um, and in the 70s and 90s, hemp had a bit of a resurgence in Canada and in Europe. Uh, and that's uh, when the 0.3% THC standard for defining hemp was adopted. It was a paper that came out, and I believe in 1973 by Dr. Small. Um, he kind of just put that uh, standard out there, um, and it was adopted widely. So uh, meanwhile, hemp was sort of uh, gaining popularity as a grain crop um, during the uh, late, you know, 1900s. And uh, the United States also became interested in growing this crop. And eventually the 2014 Farm Bill allowed states to establish pilot programs. And that's when Maine got uh, involved. Uh, Gary Fish, who we all know, uh, started the program here in Maine. There was a variety of, of legislative efforts to get the uh, program going. And by 2015, we had LD4, which started hemp's licensing program. There uh, was a statute that came out and also uh, a regulation that started the licensing program in the Department of Ag. 2018, the farm, there was another farm bill which legalized commodity hemp production in the United States. Other states got on board at that point. It was also recognized by the USDA that the United States needed sort of a unifying baseline uh, regulatory program for licensing hemp production. And an interim final rule was issued in 2019. And uh, that was to establish a domestic hemp production program. There was uh, two rounds of comments for that rule which probably a lot of you are aware of. And just last Friday, the, the USDA issued the final rule. Um, so uh, that's where we are right now. And I will talk about that final rule in the middle part of this presentation. Okay, hemp. Hemp is defined as cannabis sativa that has a THC concentration of less than 0.3% by dry weight. Now, how do we, what do we measure when we look at THC? Well, THC stands for Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol or Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol. We all know it as Delta 9 THC. Um, and that is what 
we use to uh, what we measure here in Maine to define hemp. So we look at a concentration of 0 0.3 percent or less delta 9 THC. However, there is a precursor molecule, THC acid, uh, which turns into delta 9 THC upon heating. And uh, the USDA uh, wants total or max THC to be the standard for defining hemp. And there's a calculation there. I don't know if you could see my mouse or not in this presentation. So THC acid, multiply that by 87% plus delta 9 THC, and that gets you your total or potential max THC in a hemp sample. And that is what uh, many labs, uh, well, all labs that are analyzing hemp samples will show you in addition to the delta 9 THC concentration. All right, so in Maine, once again, because we were one of the pilot state programs under the Farm Bill 2014, we are able to have the choice as to which threshold standard we want to follow. And our program has been using the Delta 9 THC of less than 0.3% on a dry weight basis to define hemp. And this is how it is in our regulation for the time being. All right. Are there questions that I need to look at? Doesn't seem that way. Um, so why license? Well, it's the law. Um, this is a peculiar crop. It is the same as, as marijuana or cannabis, uh, which is, of course, federally illegal. So therefore, we have uh, licensing programs and regulations to uh, define um, one crop from the other. Um, in Maine, if you grow to sell or you want to grow more than three plants for personal use, you need a license. It, uh, licensing also documents your intent to grow hemp. It registers the precise locations and areas where your hemp grow is located. And that's important because during the summer, we do get phone calls from law enforcement uh, responding to complaints about uh, someone sees Cannabis sativa growing, is, is it a hemp uh, grow site? Is it licensed? So it's very important <laughs> that you license, that we have that information uh, and that you are licensed, obviously. It generates an official uh, certificate analysis for each lot of hemp that you grow that demonstrates that this crop is indeed hemp. And I'll just repeat again, it's the law. You need to be licensed if you want to grow hemp for commercial purposes. So, um, and I do need to take a drink. So we have this new USDA final rule uh, that just came out, but um, I wanna emphasize that um, the main program is gonna remain as it has been through the rest of this year. So um, through 2021, Maine is gonna continue to use the Delta 9 THC standard of less than 0.3% dry weight to define hemp. We are going to continue to advise growers as we have been for the past several seasons to keep both Delta 9 THC and max THC below 0.3%. Um, and why? Because outside of Maine, hemp with max THC above 0.3% is considered marijuana. Um, not all states are like Maine and the federal government is not like Maine. So um, to for your hemp crop to have uh, maximum market reach, comply with the max THC standard and keep that below 0.3%. Um, through the rest of this year, we're gonna use that same license application process as we have been doing. And I'll talk some more about that in the next couple of slides. Um, we are going to continue to keep address and location information confidential, and we continue to only regulate the growing of hemp. Maine does not have a processor licensing program at this time. So, all right, the application process. Um, you know you're going to grow hemp uh, at some point, uh, planting it, maybe late May, June. Please get your application to us 30 days before you plant. Um, I didn't put this in any slide, but we also license indoor grows, and indoor grows theoretically can happen any time of the year, but the same, uh, same 
request applies 30 days before you plant, at least. That gives us a chance to process the paperwork and get you with a final um, hemp license agreement in your hands before you plant. Um, we do have separate indoor and outdoor application forms and separate indoor outdoor uh, licenses. You need to complete a landowner consent form if you don't own the land or the facility that you're growing in. We can only accept checks and money orders at this time. Hopefully that will change in the future when we can do electronic payments, but right now we cannot. So uh, you need to mail those in. There is a $100 application fee. You send that in with your complete application. If everything looks good and we have all the additional forms and information we need, um, uh, I will sign a draft license agreement, send that back to you, and uh, then you look that over and you get to pay the licensing fee. It's $500 plus $50 per acre or 25 cents per square foot. Um, send that back. We issue the final license agreement. It's signed. We send that back to you. We do all of this by email primarily. If you don't do email, we certainly can mail stuff to you, but more or less 99% of our document exchanges by email. So please give us an email address that you check often. And please don't send us all your fees with the initial application. This is a metered process. We want the chance to look at your application materials and it, it, it kind of gets confusing if you send the application fee and what you think is your license fee and your acreage fee all at the same time. So we ask that you don't do that. All right. Um, uh, certificate of analysis. Uh, we request, actually, I'm going to jump ahead here. No, well, maybe I won't. All right, certificate of analysis. Why not? So um, this is uh, this is a lab out in Colorado, Botanicor, and they were nice enough to have this. How do you read a COA um, website, which you can check out? Uh, this is uh, something you should get when you buy seeds or seedlings um, from from companies, and if you don't get it, you should request it because this is to demonstrate that the parents of the seeds or the seedlings that you are buying are hemp. Um, and what you need to look at, and I'm realizing this is probably very difficult to see in this presentation, but you wanna look at the Delta 9 THC concentration, uh, which is on this second line here. Uh, you could, could look at the Delta 9 THC acid, but what you probably, better to look at is your total THC on this line. And it does that calculation for you. It takes the Delta nine um, and uh, it adds it uh, to the acid 80 plus 87% and it gives you that percentage there. I'm gonna get, here we go, this is much better. All right, and this particular uh, pretend COA for a hemp line passes because you can see that total potential THC is under 0.3% by dry weight. You can also see what the Delta nine is at 0.03, which is good. And you also get to see what some of the other components, the cannabinoid profile are for this particular hemp line. All right. Um, so you should get that. You don't have to send it in with your application. Perhaps that is something that will change in, in future uh, regulatory changes. We might ask that to come with your application. But right now, that's something you send in with your planting report. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the application is two pages. This is page two for an outdoor license application. It looks very similar for the indoor. This is where you tell us where your grow sites are. Um, the form allows for three grow sites. If you need more than three grow sites, you just make copies of this form. Um, give us a street address. Uh, we do need to know the GPS uh, location of your sites and please use decimal degrees for that information. Uh, total acreage is something we wanna know. And also what are you growing for? Most folks in Maine are growing for a uh, resinous flower crop but um, you could be growing for grain or fiber. And that is, is important for us to know in terms of um, our planning to do uh, sampling or understanding what it is we're looking at when we do an inspection. Anticipated harvest date is also important information. 
oops, um, property owner. If you are not the property owner, you need to uh, identify who is. All right, a little bit more on the GPS coordinates. Um, this I think is pretty easy, but you know, everybody has different computers and apps and software and phones. Um, so basically I open up Google Maps, I click on a spot, this happens to be a, a field at the Viles Arboretum, click, drop a pin, um, and boop, I get this box and look at that, it's showing me in decimal degrees with six decimal places, the location of that pin. And I am pretending this is my hemp grow site. These are the numbers that you need to put in your application. When folks send degrees, minutes, seconds, we need to convert them. These are uh, pretty awkward. Uh, imagine trying to put in this in a phone <laughs> when you're driving around trying to find a grow site. It's, it's, not, it's not very friendly to uh, machines or to people using machines. So we ask that you use decimal degrees with at least five decimal points. Okay. Um, this is our brand new hemp grow site consent form. We haven't had one of these um, and we hope this kind of makes things easier for folks. It sort of standardizes the process. Uh, you identify yourselves here and the property owner gets to fill out um, much of this. Uh, so, uh, or their legal representative and they get to sign it. Um, the consent form itself doesn't authorize you to start growing hemp. Um, it's simply part of the application package that you send to us. So we do need permission from the landowner. All right, the application process. You've mailed in your paperwork. You haven't heard from us. You know, it's been a week. It's been two weeks. That's odd. Um, please don't uh, be shy about that. Make contact. Things happen. Mail gets lost sometimes. Emails get overlooked. Um, we don't want that to happen, but sometimes it does. So make contact. You do need to have a signed final hemp license agreement from the hemp licensing program in order to grow hemp. And um, there's phone numbers and email addresses for myself and my colleagues on the hemp webpage. So please use them to see what's going on with your application if you haven't heard from us. There are some responsibilities, of course, after you receive your uh, final hemp license agreement from us. One of them is the planting report, which is due 14 days after you actually plant um, your crop. It could be setting it up in, a, in, in, in an interior facility if you're an indoor grower. Um, more than likely it is uh, transplanting your seedlings or sowing your seeds um, in a field outdoors. So 14 days, two weeks afterwards, please fill this out. You do need to plant your hemp in lots. And a lot is a distinct variety that is planted at about the same time in a location. That's how we define lots. Um, if you are growing three different varieties of hemp, please don't mix them all up in a field, grow them in distinct areas because we will want to sample each of those varieties. And that becomes very difficult to do if they are integrated all together um, in a row or in a plot. So please keep them in distinct areas and get a, give us a little GPS reading if you can for that particular lot. That would be great. Um, also, as I hinted to before, for each variety or cultivar that you grow, please include a certificate analysis for the parent stock. And this comes from the source of your seeds or seedlings or clones. If you're the source, if you've been breeding these things, well, you've got a COA from the department from the previous year or the year before that. So do enclose that. That's just, that's just very tidy to do that. Um, and we also encourage, again, please don't grow hemp varieties that um, the parents have a, a COA that says it, it gets hot, that it has a, a tendency for a max THC reading above the 0.3% dry weight. Okay, um, some more responsibilities. Uh, schedule sampling. As harvest time approaches, we need to get out there and sample. And, um, and since we're doing it by lots, uh, this year we noticed it got a little crazy in September. So we need some lead time. We're still doing the 25 days from harvest. Um, and if you haven't heard from us or you haven't reached out and contacted us about getting your hemp lot sampled and you're within that 25 day window to, to harvest, please get in touch with us. Um, 
once we sample, you're expected to harvest that lot within those the, the 25 day window from the time we were there clipping the flowers. I think um, some growers had this notion that they had 25 days from when they received the lab report, the COA from that sample, um, but that is incorrect. Um, and I realize that's a little awkward. You kind of want to know what your THC uh, concentrations are before you harvest, but um, uh, you, you sometimes that is not possible. All right, did this just move on me? It did. Um, all right, so the other thing I want to stress is that the THC keeps increasing as flowers mature, and we want an accurate snapshot of the THC content for that lot. Um, and if you, instead of, you know, 25 days, you don't harvest for 40 days, well, as you can imagine, that sample that we took 40 days ago is not going to accurately represent uh, what's, what the concentration of THC is in your crop anymore. Um, Generally speaking, the um, the COAs that we get from the lab after we sample are issued in in 10 days or so from when we sample. If for some reason it hasn't arrived in a timely fashion, like I said, you do need to harvest your plant material. Don't sell it. Put it in your storage place. Dry it. Um, um, and then you will get that COA and you'll be able to market your uh, your crop as you planned. Um, if all goes well. All right. So crops testing above the allowable Delta 9 THC limit must be destroyed by the grower according to instructions received from the department. So that is how we have been operating and that is how we will continue to operate this year. Um, another licensee responsibility is reporting your harvest data. It's required. We've been using surveys in order to keep your information anonymous. Um, and it's, it's, it's working okay. We still have um, a number of folks who have not reported their harvest data yet, and um, we'll be chasing folks down soon about that. We also use surveys to learn about your experiences growing hemp and to give us some feedback about this, how the licensing program is going. And we ask that you, you please complete those surveys. It's, it, it's fun, you can vent, um, let us know how things are going. Um, so if you haven't already done that and you were a licensed grower this past year, please finish your surveys. I'm gonna pause for questions now, Gary. I'm gonna take a drink. All right, Mary. So we had one question that I can see so far. It says, uh, if you want to grow hemp seed for eating, you have to get a license for personal use only. So that's kind of a complicated question. Oh, well, um, provided you're not growing more than three plants for exactly. yourself for personal <laughs> use, that's just fine. Um, yeah, and you'll you'll need you'll need a male, right? If you want to have seeds. Right. Yeah. So if you grow <laughs> any more than three plants per person, then you have to have a license. Right. regardless of what you're growing it for. Correct. Anything else? Uh, I don't see any other questions. All right, I'm gonna keep going then. Great. All right, wow, here it is, the exciting USDA Domestic Hemp Production Program Final Rule. So this came out, I guess we got, we got the little advance notice on Friday, but it, it, it just came out this weekend. So um, this has been long awaited and, and perhaps a little controversial. There were at least two rounds of, of comments uh, solicited by USDA from the public on this. And um, yeah, let's go through some of that. So I guess I'll give a little bit of history as well. This past August, um, we, Gary wrote up a, a plan, a state plan uh, of compliance under the USDA rule, and we submitted that and it was accepted. We thought that it had to be done um, before October of this past year, October 2020. So we did that, it was accepted. Um, there's a lot of moving and changing parts with hemp at every regulatory level. Uh, and as it turns out, um, there, you know, the final rule was delayed 
until January right now. We any to make the long story short, or to cover up the fact that I'm not very good at articulating the details, and Gary can do that. Um, we had the opportunity to continue operating under our current program for yet another year, and and that is what. Maine is going to do. So even though we had submitted a plan and it was approved, we're kind of putting that on, on the shelf for yet another season. And, and quite honestly, because of the changes that took place in the USDA final rule, just revealed, we're going to have to go back and, and change things in that plan anyways. Um, and every other state that has a an accepted plan submitted to the USDA last year is going to have to do the same thing because there's some differences. So I hope that made sense. Um, so looking ahead to 2022, uh, when, if you want to be playing under the USDA uh, hemp program, we're, we're going to have to abide by this new final rule. Um, these are the changes that are going to have to happen uh, in Maine. And these are statute changes, because right now, current Maine statute regarding the hemp program um, is not, not, not lining up with what the USDA final rule says. So um, we're going to have to do background checks of key participants in each hemp farm business. Um, we currently do not do that. I don't even think we collect information on all key participants at, at this point in time. So we will have to codify that somehow. Um, there is a convicted felon ban under the USDA final rule and a person with a state or federal felony conviction related to a controlled substance is subject to a 10 year ineligibility restriction on becoming licensed. Um, so we, we have none of that in our uh, main statute. So that is gonna have to um, go into a, a, a revised statute if indeed we are going to be a USDA hemp licensing program. Um, and uh, regarding that felon ban, there is an, a, an exception that applies to persons who lawfully grew hemp um, before December 20th, 2018, and whose conviction also occurred before that date. So these are kind of meaty bits, and I'm probably not spending enough time on, on any of it, but we don't have enough time to do that. So, all right, some more main statute changes that will be needed in order to comply with the USDA final rule. Um, so that that personal use exemption from licensing that Maine enjoys, that is going to have to go away. The USDA expects that um, all such hemp must be licensed. Um, so if you did want to grow a high CBD, low THC cannabis sativa plant, that plant will just have to be counted under your permitted uh, marijuana or cannabis plants. So that's a way to still have a hemp plant and, and not necessarily get a license. Um, grow site locations and crop data. Right now, all of that, well, the grow site locations, that has been confidential in Maine, but that will need to change in the statute because the USDA expects us to report location data and crop data on a monthly basis to the Farm Service Association, um, which is a, a USDA agency. Um, so, and this little box is from the Farm Service website, F FSA website. <clears throat> All right, um, on a change, which uh, I think is a good one and a little unexpected. USDA interim rule had a 15 day harvest window. They listened to uh, the comments that came in and they've expanded that to 30 days. So that is quite nice. Um, and looking forward to that. One of the, the things that did not change, and I know a lot of people were hoping that it would, is the, the threshold, the definition for hemp remains as this, it's max or total THC less than 0.3% dry weight. And that would have to become our new threshold for Maine. So we would no longer be using the Delta nine, we would be using total THC. And I think um, we, we need to pretend that that is the case this year and be practicing for that, so. All right, the new USDA rule also has uh, um, regulatory language regarding the negligent violation. Uh, they changed this, so the interim rule had, had a lower threshold for that. Um, if your hemp tested at 0.5%, uh, max THC, that was considered a negligent violation. Now it is uh, nudged up to 1%. 
uh, which is which is good. A little more flexibility there. So I think it's a three strike and you're out. Uh, Gary, you can jump in if I'm misstating that. So if you have three negligent violations, then um, you you will probably not be able to license uh, for a little while. That's Remediation. Correct. Yeah, okay, great. So um, there's also a little flexibility now in the USDA rule regarding remediation. Uh, hemp crops that test above 0.3% total THC may be usable after remediation if you um, add biomass to it or remove flowers and you have to retest. This, this is, there's some details that I'm obviously glossing over here, but there, anyways, there is some flexibility how practical that is for main farms to use. I don't know there's some flexibility. And disposal of non-compliant plants, the language in the USDA rule did um, ease up a little bit. And we can do on-site disposal of um, non-compliant plants under our um, approval or surveillance, and that will be allowed. Uh, they took out the language about the uh, reverse distributor and law enforcement and DEA. So that's a good thing. Okay. Um, so that is my short story about the USDA rule. Um, so our advice for 2021 is please try to grow plants that have less than 0.3 total THC at harvest time. Choose your varieties and sources carefully. Test your flowers as they mature, so keeping an eye on those levels. Try not to stress your plants out. I know that's really hard to do sometimes if you had a year like, 2020, where you had drought and uh, cold snaps and frosts. Um, yep, it is hard to do. Avoid harvesting late. Um, and uh, again, I will remind everyone that non-compliant plants um, may be illegal in other states. In other words, plants that uh, comply with Maine's Delta 9 threshold, but have a max THC above 0.3%. While that's okay in Maine, it is not okay um, outside of Maine in, in some instances. So do bear that in mind. Um, so um, it'll be a busy year in order to uh, uh, make our program compliant with the USDA, if that is to happen. So there's going to be some upcoming rulemaking. Um, and we ask folks who are interested in this topic to stay in touch because when there's rulemaking, there's uh, ability for the public to attend hearings and to submit comments. So please look for announcements about that. Um, both the statute and our regulation uh, that we use in the department will have to change. And uh, I'll show you the website at the end of the program, but certainly keeping an eye on the hemp webpage. Uh, signing up for the hemp program newsletter is a very good way to uh, to be, be abreast of when there's going to be hearings and, and public comment periods. All right, another pause for questions. All right, so we've got um, a couple of questions here, Mary. Okay. One is uh, to clarify, we cannot sell any part of the plant until we received a CO COA certificate of analysis back from you. Yes. Would that you agree, correct. Gary? I agree. <laughs> and uh, then we have one. Can we take advantage of the 30-day harvest window and other positive changes in the new federal rule this season prior to 2022 when we adopt our state plan? I'll answer that one. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. no, we can't because we are operating under the state law and the state law is more restrictive. And until that law is changed or that rule is changed, then we have to operate under that. And then the next one is, uh, do hemp farmers qualify for drought assistance program payments for 2020 growing season if we are registered with FSA and also grow and grew in prior season? That's that's a great question, but that I don't think we question. can answer that one. Uh, I, I didn't hear you. You can't answer that one, Gary? I don't think we can answer that one. Oh, I think okay. we have to ask FSA that yeah. question. I think it's possible, but I, I do not know for sure. I definitely have to go to FSA on that. That that would be a good topic for a, for a little newsletter thing too, I think. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. Uh, uh, anything else? And 
nope, that's the that's it for questions right now. Okay, I shall continue. Oh my gosh. Okay, I guess this is the part of the show where I show some pictures and talk about um, maybe some agronomic uh, aspects of hemp growing. Um, yeah. So growing hemp in Maine. I am not. Uh, I am not John Jemison. Hopefully, folks know who John Jemison is. He's an extension professor with uh, Maine Cooperative Extension, and uh, he uh, has been really excited about hemp as a crop. He went to Colorado and did a sabbatical out there. He's been working on some Maine farms this year. So I will give you his information. So he is a good person to reach out to if you want some really good uh, uh, information on on site selection and growing, um, but I'll, I'll give you some highlights here. So um, hemp is a lot like a, a small grain or a corn crop in, in terms of where it will do best growing and in terms of its nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium needs. So that is something to keep in mind. Folks like to say that, you know, hemp is a weed, it can grow anywhere. Uh, it's amazing. And while, you know, certainly I've seen cannabis sativa plants in some pretty stressed out rural locations, if you're trying to grow this for a saleable crop, uh, for resin or grain, um, you certainly don't want to give it a rural landscape to grow in. You want you want to do better than that to get a good crop. Uh, so good uh, site preparation is is definitely recommended, as well as um, finding uh, appropriate fields. Um, hemp likes a certain uh likes actually a reasonable amount of rainfall or water during the growing season i think it's up to about 30 inches 25 to 30 inches over the season uh, and it needs a fair amount of it early on to get established however hemp doesn't like to be waterlogged it doesn't want to have wet feet um, and this is a an, an image to illustrate that uh perhaps it's not that obvious uh, in this format, but this uh, soil over here is kind of waterlogged. You can see it's dark. It might even have a little crust forming on it. And you can see the difference in the height of the plants. The, the cannabis that was, I don't know if it was seeded or transplanted that are in sort of higher and drier ground here are much taller than the ones that are in this wet area. So it, it really doesn't like to be in waterlogged um, circumstances. So choose sites that have uh, well-drained, loamy soils, silty soils, good organic matter um, content. Um, I've seen plants uh, installed in compacted ground and they don't look very happy. You do need to sort of work the soil. You want to have beds for your plants to grow in. Uh, this is on a farm that uh, grows lots of different crops uh, and they have good weed management. Um, seed bed prep is very good. It looks to me like this is a well-drained soil, organic matter. You can almost see it in this photograph. So these plants are nicely spaced. They are in raised beds slightly. Uh, the root zone of these cannabis plants are gonna have uh, room to grow and these should be pretty happy plants. <clears throat> Weeds are a common problem, especially in the early part of uh, the lifespan of your cannabis plants. Uh, if you're, hopefully folks are mostly transplanting plants, especially if you're growing for resinous flower, I think that probably works best than seeding. Um, and uh, weeds can be a big problem for young plants. Once the, the cannabis plants get larger, they can, can, can muscle, muscle out of some weedy situations, but certainly a plan for weed control is, is recommended. Uh, folks use mulches. Here's a farm where there's a plastic mulch layer that has been laid down. You can also see that the Plastic mulch layer is on a raised bed. Again, this is a nice root zone for your plants to be happy in. Um, I guarantee you that there is probably irrigation uh, tape underneath this plastic mulch layer. Uh, this past season, 2020, 
Uh, and it was also true for 2019. We had some really hot, dry summer months and uh, drought was an issue. So having a plan to irrigate your plants and give them that, you know, 25, 30 inches of water they need during the growing season uh, is a terrific idea. Um, what else? Uh, in this particular farm, it looks like they're using some sort of a, a, a clover in the, in the rows between the plants, which is great. That's a nitrogen fixer that's going to help improve the soil uh, long term. And uh, it's also going to suppress weeds. You're not going to have a lot of um, uh, unwanted plants growing up in the walkways between your uh, hemp crop that may lay down seeds and, and continue sort of a, a weedy battle in future years. So that's a great idea as well. <clears throat> uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about um, some basic agronomics? I think that is probably about it for that. Um, some other things to think about is Pollen, uh, pollen drift, pollen trespass. Um, most of the hemp grown in Maine at the moment is grown for its resinous flowers, for CBD, for CBG, um, terpenes. And that comes from the unpollinated female flower. Uh, once, if, if your flowers get pollinated, they start diverting resources to seed production and the chemistry of the flower changes. So generally speaking, you don't want uh, pollinated flowers. So pollen is an issue. Um, in 2019, when I did inspections, I did see a, a, quite a few male flowers out there or male plants. Um, I saw far less this past year. So I think um, we have either a better handle on uh, feminized plants, feminized seed, or people growing clones. There was just less of it, or people were out there roguing their male plants um, much more religiously than they had in the previous season. But, um, you know, this, this could be a, you could get complaints if your neighbors are also growing uh, hemp or other cannabis sativa crops. Um, they do not want uh, your male pollen plants um, fertilizing their female plants. So something to think about. And um, in, in the future, when location data is not confidential, perhaps we can have um, some sort of maps which will help identify where uh, some farms may be growing male plants. If you're growing grain, you need male plants. So um, you just want to make sure you're growing grain uh, at some distance away from uh, other types of, of cannabis farms. And uh, pollen can travel three miles, 10 miles in some cases, so it can really get around. All right. The other thing I wanted to mention was weeds, hemp gone wild. Uh, if you do let, you know, male and female plants hang out together, you're going to get seeds. And uh, yeah, and seeds left to drop in particularly fertile situations will emerge next year. You don't want an accidental hemp uh, grow site. Uh, again, uh, the public may see that and call it in and wonder why you have an, an acre of hemp growing that's not licensed and maybe you didn't even know about it. So do keep an eye on uh, land that has been used to grow hemp and, and the areas adjacent to those uh, grow sites and make sure there's no escapees. Maine doesn't need any more agricultural weeds. Um, all right. The other point I wanted to bring up, and we can, you know, we can probably have a whole talk about this, is contamination in hemp. Um, hemp uh, is an accumulator of metals and other substances. So probably one of the things that I would do if I were a hemp farmer is uh, certainly get a basic soil test, probably several soil tests for um, for a field, and um, you can get those very. Uh, economically from the University of Maine. I think, I don't know, 12 bucks, 15 bucks. I don't know what the current price is, but it's not very much. And it will give you a, a great analysis of, you know, the, the nutrients and the organic matter uh, present in your soil sample. It will also tell you whether there's lead in that soil. And that's really important because hemp can accumulate uh, bioaccumulate lead. And that is um, not something you want in your CBD final product. Um, remember, 
you're generally, this is a plant that's being grown for therapeutic products. So the last thing you want is to have some uh, harm, potentially harmful materials in your CBD like cadmium or arsenic or lead. Um, so do be aware of that. Most labs like uh, Proverde can also um, uh, test for metals and other substances in your hemp. Um, and that is uh, probably something worth checking out as well. Um, why would there be lead or arsenic in your soils? Well, all sorts of reasons. Um, if it's an old farm site, uh, lead could be coming from uh, paint that was used on uh, you know, houses and barns, uh, lead solder from roof uh, or pipes. Um, lead arsenate is a, a pesticide that was used in the past. Um, these things can sort of hang out in soils for a very long time. Um, uh, main uh, geology, we have a lot of uh, granite uh, bedrock uh, that has naturally high levels of uranium and arsenic. And those substances can also accumulate in hemp crops. So these are just some things to be aware of that you can suss out um, uh, you know, by doing some soil tests perhaps or learning a little bit more about the history of your site. And, um, and probably folks at uh, Humane Extension can, can help you with that as well. Um, and, you know, and certainly these issues are not unique to hemp, but because hemp has a proclivity for bioaccumulating some substances, definitely worth checking out. Okay, looking at the time, 9.15. Pests. Uh, certainly there are a lot of things that like to munch on hemp. Uh, this is, uh, somebody's been chowing on these leaves. Uh, that's a little snail. There were slugs. There's some other little creature up here. Um, there's plant hoppers, there's tarnished plant bugs, which will suck on um, leaf tissue and leave characteristic little holes, none of which I necessarily see here. Some of these other uh, pests will literally chew on the leaves. I, I, fortunately, hemp is such a new crop uh, here in Maine. I don't think we have uh, built up tremendous uh, pest diversity or pest levels that um, you know, we need to be too worried about, that may change in the future. Um, and, I, you know, even though we see lots of critters on hemp plants and doing some damage, uh, I'm not sure the damage is, has been so great that crop harvests um, have been affected necessarily. So that's a good thing. It, it certainly needs additional monitoring and folks keeping an eye on the different creatures that show up on their hemp plants. And, and certainly folks in the, uh, in the plant health office at the department where the hemp licensing office is located can help out with that. Um, and we have an IPM entomologist, Kathy Murray, who loves to uh, look at pest critters and identify them and, and figure out non-pesticidal ways to, to deal with um, such pests. All right. So this past year, it seemed it must have been a, a boom year for voles. Uh, I had a lot of voles in my garden. They, they were taking my pepper plants out of a greenhouse and dragging them into a hole in the ground where they were nesting, like a tremendous amount of pepper plants. I was very upset at, at the voles. Apparently they were doing this on hemp farms as well. These little critters, super cute. They like cover. Um, and I'm guessing this was a sort of snow covered or had some sort of mulch layer over it. But here's, a, a you know, you can see their little trails through the turf, whoops, through the turf. Um, uh, I had a lot of mulch hay in my greenhouse where they were living and creating these tunnels. Um, hemp growers often use mulch, uh, plastic mulch, provides awesome cover for voles and they will make their tunnels right under the mulch, the plastic mulch that goes right next to all of your hemp plants. And uh, in one farm in particular, they, they had a lot of losses due to voles. What you can do is uh, put little mouse traps. You don't even have to bait them across perpendicular, across these little trailways. Um, so that voles just run right across them and get trapped. You want to put some sort of cover over it um, such that the trap can still operate, but that you're not, um, you know, killing non-target organisms. And, and also the understand the biology of the vole is they like to run through covered tunnels. So that's one way to try and deal with, um, with metal voles, but that was an issue this year. They also um, 
would uh, gnaw at the stems of more mature plants, which is um, detrimental. And in that case, you could put little collars around the base of your uh, adult hemp plants to, you know, dissuade or protect them from being gnawed on by voles or perhaps other other rodents out there. Hemp russet mite, that was um, a, uh, an, a new and exciting pest insect uh, to uh, enter Maine. Um, I don't think it's been noted in the field in Maine before. Uh, it's kind of new to New England. Um, and something to keep a, a lookout for. We don't know where this overwinters or if it can overwinter in Maine. Um, you know, it's certainly known as a, as a greenhouse uh, a pest, an indoor cannabis pest. Um, this has been shown to uh, impact uh, cannabis sativa crops at high levels of infestation. Um, so they're very tiny. You really, you can't see, really see them with the naked eye. So you need some sort of a hand lens or a dissecting scope. And the arrows are showing the little, little bodies. They look like little tiny grains of rice. Um, and one of the signs that perhaps your plant may have hemp russet mite is the tacoing, sort of the leaves get this kind of funny curl to them and, and some discoloration. But you know what? Those are signs perhaps of, of other uh, um, health issues or infestation issues. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have hemp russet mite, but it might be worth um, taking a leaf, turning it over and looking at it under power to see what's going on. Um, and if you think you have hemp russet mite, please let the office know and we'd, we'd love to come and, and take samples and, and figure out what's going on. <clears throat> um, a lot of uh, growers did comment that they had borers this past season. Uh, this is a photo I took in 2019. Uh, this is kind of characteristic a lot of this sort of sawdust. So there is a, a larva, a lepidopteran larva inside the stem of your hemp plant and they're boring. And this is some of the stuff, the, the junk that they are creating. Um, eventually this will probably snap and that's not good, uh, particularly if the borer is at lower levels on your plant. Um, so this is uh, an image of the <clears throat> European hemp borer. Corn borers can also um, have the same effect on hemp plants. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the levels of the European hemp borer are in Maine. Uh, someone else is uh, perhaps uh, Kathy Murray will speak to that on Thursday when um, she and Mary Tomlinson and myself will be giving a presentation for the Board of Pesticide Control. Um, Whitney Cranshaw at Colorado State University has a really awesome website devoted to hemp insects. Um, and if you haven't checked that out already, please do. He's got a lot of good information on there. Um, I, I, I don't think we have an epidemic of borers in Maine, but they, they seem like it's, you know, a lot of the larger growers, grow sites seem to have some level of, of hemp borer damage going on. Uh, disease, uh, not my specialty at all, but certainly uh, there are diseases of hemp. This is some sort of uh, damping off or uh, pythium, who knows? This is some sort of fungal or bacterial infection of a young hemp transplant. Um, that, that plant is not gonna make it. Um, and uh, later in the season, uh, there's certainly sort of powdery mildews and other uh, fungal diseases that uh, will affect the foliage and, and inflorescence of plants. So um, yes, we do have diseases in Maine and the University of Maine does have a, a diagnostic lab and I believe that they can send you a kit so uh, you can culture uh, a sample of, of what's um, bothering your plants and send that back for a diagnos diagnosis. Um, and also I'm sure John Jemison is uh, someone you can talk to about uh, diseases that are impacting your crop as well. Um, uh, and I guess I, I don't have a slide for it, but I will put a, a, a big promo out for crop rotation. Um, it's, 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 it is important, um, again, because hemp is such a new crop in Maine, 
Uh, maybe uh, we've been sort of getting away without uh, seriously doing proper crop rotations, but that time is probably coming to an end. You, you really should try not to grow hemp multiple seasons in a row in the same place. Um, diseases do build up, uh, pests as well. Um, uh, so um, come up with a plan, a crop rotation plan um, for your uh, hemp enterprise. Um, another uh, problem this year, a lot of growers lost beautiful plants, unfortunately, was frost. Uh, we had some frost events in June at the beginning of the season, which took out some seedlings. Uh, and then we had uh, a, two, two rounds of pretty good frost in like September and October. And we still had plants out in the field that were finishing up. And um, yeah, not a pretty scene. And it, it almost looks like it got hit with an herbicide in some cases. Uh, it's it, it, uh, yeah, uh, good to know the difference, obviously. Um, so that was a problem. Uh, and learning more about varieties and cultivars that have a longer or actually a shorter grow season, right? You want to avoid, uh, you want to have a tight growing season as opposed to plants that take a long time to mature because the longer you go, the more likely it is that frost is going to happen. So um, that is of interest. Um, and also perhaps there are cultivars out there that can withstand frost better than, than others. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that's the case, so. Um, all right. I did warning, mention Mary. Okay. One minute morning. Good. I'm almost done. All five, right. John, five minutes. Five minutes. All right. I, I'll still talk faster. All right. So John Jemison, I did mention John before he's probably listening right now. He is awesome. He's going to have some, uh, he's, he's had programs for hemp growers in the past. He's going to have some virtual ones in the coming months. Um, Yes, there's his contact information. Uh, and he's a great dude, fun to interact with. So um, pesticides, all right. Uh, here's what I have to say about pesticides. Um, there are not a lot that are approved for hemp. Kind of makes sense. Again, cannabis sativa not a, <laughs> hasn't been a legal crop. Uh, and hemp has been legal for just a few years. So scientists and EPA regulators, et cetera, have not had the opportunity to work with this crop and to do the research they need to on various chemical pesticides. Um, that is changing. Uh, um, the other thing I wanna say is that this is being grown again as a medicine. So um, there's lots to look at when you apply a, a substance, a chemical substance to hemp. Um, People will be eating your hemp or your CBD products. People may be smoking your hemp or your CBD products. People are applying hemp and CBD products to your to their skin. So there's lots of ways that these products are used, and there's lots of ways that um, uh, chemicals that may be applied to the plant may be taken in by the human body. So there's lots of things that have to be checked out before pesticides can be approved for use. Um, we also Mary, before and, you move on, yep, just yep. I, I want to add in the fact that pesticides does include all kinds of natural things too, not just chemicals. So it right. can include anything that's approved by OMRI or used for organic purposes. And you you really have to talk to Mary before you use any product because, and I mean Mary Tomlinson at the Board <laughs> of Pesticides Control, yes. because uh, there's very limited products that are available and you can't use them if they're not allowed. So right. just keep that in mind. Absolutely. Yes. I was going to say, yeah, we do see the OMRI label. Well, it's approved for organics. Why can't I use it on my hemp crop? Uh, um, <laughs> because you can't. Uh, you have to read the label and you need to talk to Mary Tomlinson. Um, yeah. And on the hemp website, we do have a link to a spreadsheet of products that um, Mary has approved for use on hemp for, in very specific ways. You could check that out. Um, and if you can't find that spreadsheet, I'm, I'm happy to help folks. So, yep. And Mary is going to be giving a presentation Thursday afternoon along with um, Kathy Murray, uh, the IPM expert, and a little bit again from me. And this is at, I think, from 2.30 to 5 Thursday 
it's part of the ag show, but it's kind of not. It's being run through the University of Maine and Maine's uh, Board of Pesticide Control. And it is available for uh, pesticide recertification credits. So that's something you need to sign up for separately. So a little plug for that. We do have a hemp website, of course, a web page. Here it is. Um, please, this is where our applications are. One minute. One minute. Oh, my God. We also have news and events posted on here. Very important. Hopefully, you can see my mouse. I'm circling this. This is the uh, the gov.delivery uh, newsletter uh, sign up. So put your email in there if you haven't already. And th that way you'll, you'll stay in the know about our program and about rule changes and USDA and our statutes and public comments and all of that good stuff. All right, I think this is my last slide. So again, this is my contact information uh, on that hemp webpage. Down in the lower right hand side, you have other contacts in case I get hit by a bus or stop talking to people. You can talk to my fine associates, Devin McGuire. I'm sure many of you got to meet Devin this summer. He is the seasonal hemp inspector and he's a great addition to the team. He's got a mobile phone and an email address and everyone knows and loves Gary Fish and he's still involved in, in hemp licensing. Um, yeah, although I hope he's found more time to do all of the other things he needs to do as state horticulturist now. So, all right, with that, I will shut up. I'm done. Thank you very much, everyone. So we, we did have one other question, uh, or actually two. Should a grower test for THC more often than a harvest, than at harvest? And so the, the, the test that we do is for compliance. That's just before harvest, but a grower should be testing all through the growing season once flowering starts just to know when you need to harvest so that you don't go over the 0.3% the THC standard. So I think most growers do test as the season goes on. And then there was one about, is there a Maine Hemp Association? So there used to be a Maine Hemp Industries Association. There is a Facebook uh, community called Maine Hemp Farmers Association. So there are efforts to try to start them, but as far as I know, there aren't any, um, you know, going strong at this point. And I think that's that's pretty much all the questions we have. All right. Yes. So thanks for uh, for being here today. And thank, thank you, everyone. Mary. All right. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for moderating.